morning, ladies and gentlemen. Super Kareem. My name is Maya Mansour, and I'm from Mustasharoon Bureau Admin Team. Mustasharoon Bureau is the leading provider of accounting, taxation, internal audit, and management services in Lebanon and UAE. Mustasharoon Bureau is an ISO certified in quality management and awarded twice internationally for the professionalism, quality of services, and technology. Mustasharoon Bureau, driven by its commitment to corporate social responsibility and its helping its, its customer to overcome its unprecedented economic crisis, organized this webinar under the title How to Succeed in a Turbulent Economy. Local and international expert panelists will outline pressing issues from their respective standpoints. The, uh, the presentation and discussion will provide a comprehensive global overview in terms of problems we are facing and the necessary solutions. This one and half hour exclusive webinar is designed to help executives and business professionals stay ahead of fast changing political and economical trends impacting our economy. We will be running a live question and answer at the end of the webinar. We also have enabled our Ask a Question feature. It's on the right-hand side of your session in the auditorium. So if you have any question, just pop them in here. Our speakers will be happy to answer as much as they can of your question. And if you miss anything, don't worry. We'll be sending around the on-demand recording when it's available. We will also launch three polls during the webinar. Uh, you can see now, we will start our first one just now. We'll share it with you. So please try to uh, answer the question within 30 or one minute maximum. Okay, now uh, without further delay, I'm happy to introduce our speaker for today. So uh, we have uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor Theophilus Grigoriadis, a CHPhD assistant professor at Frey University in Berlin, Germany. So uh, I will hand over to you, uh, Professor. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation. Thank you very much for um, uh, to, um, to to all of you for inviting me to this fascinating panel. Uh, it is an honor for me to talk about the Lebanese economy, and uh, this is uh, actually a question that I have been actively thinking about uh, since last year, since my first visit to Lebanon as an expert, as part of an expert group to uh, the UN ESQA, the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, um, where the challenges already uh, for the Lebanese economy were pretty clear even before the COVID situation comes into the picture. So what is the situation right now? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer an interpretation and some baseline analysis of current developments in Lebanon, and then uh, make some policy recommendations uh, that are required both at the level of governmental policy, at the international macro level, uh, but also at the level of um, development, of, um, uh, of boosting economic development, of supporting small and medium enterprises. So uh, what is the situation right now? What we're observing right now in Lebanon has all the elements of a standard textbook financial crisis. What is going on? There is not enough liquidity at the market. The central bank uh, is really not in a position without external support to control the currency in such a way so that the banking system remains reliable and uh, trustworthy, uh, both by domestic and international investors. There is a very strong black market for the Lebanese pound and at the same time, and there is a major difference between the, the black market rate and the official governmental rate or the central bank rate. Uh, and of course, as we know very well uh, from, uh, from, from economics, when, uh, when the currency is unstable, this of course it deters in, uh, foreign, foreign investors, deters the F FDI flows into the economy, but not only that, uh, uh, it actually undermines uh, the ability of um, of the uh, of, 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 of lenders to pay of, of borrowers actually to pay back their their, uh, their loans to the bank. 
And all this in addition to the situation of the major indebt indebtment of the Lebanese economy as such, that makes um, uh, the Lebanese pound both um, uh, inter internationally and domestically not a very reliable means of transactions. So this situation, on the one hand, the unstable currency, and on the other hand, the indebtment uh, of the Lebanese economy, the, very, the, the rising levels of debt, are creating a vicious circle uh, that is mainly affecting the situation of uh, small and medium enterprises, but also of major business. It actually affects everyone. So, and, and the situation right now is, I mean, so what to do? And uh, in addition to that, we are observing a, a diminishing trust in the banking system. We observe phenomena that resemble to banking panics, um, to banking panics, uh, like uh, major withdrawals of currencies, uh, major withdrawals of deposits from, uh, from the Lebanese banks. Um, um, so, and uh, in general, a, a phenomenon that is only aggravating in that direction. So what to do? How are we dealing how are we dealing with this, with this major financial crisis that is uh, affecting um, not only the banking system, but by extension, all the productive sectors of the economy? So uh, at, at first, what is really important is to reach, of course, a deal with the IMF, uh, but not a short-term deal, actually a longer-term deal uh, with the support of the two main um, uh, monetary policy actors of the globe, the Fed, the U.S. Fed, the American Central Bank, and the European Central Bank. What is quite important is that the Lebanese government reaches a deal with the IMF with the active support of these two central banks uh, in, um, um, in the U.S. And, and the European Union, so that a long-run liquidity umbrella is actually offered to the Lebanese economy with the purpose of supporting the currency, of supporting primarily the banking system, who does not, uh, which, does, which, can, which cannot cash out its obligations from the entrepreneurs at this point. At the same time, what could be, what is necessary and complementary to this uh, long, uh, long term liquidity umbrella offered by the IMF, uh, the Fed, and the ECB is also, of course, that the government itself, in order to um, uh, increase, to maximize the effect of this liquidity umbrella, it must agree. Uh, with the IMF and also the World Bank, which actually is much more important in, the, in this segment of policy, to support, in, in, so to create a complementary World Bank package for the support of particularly small and medium enterprises, and also of supporting major enterprises not to leave the territory of Lebanon, because uh, because when a company, when a major company, I mean, we, we focus on small and medium enterprises because this is of course a very important component of any functioning economy, but also major businesses are, are very important, uh, offer very powerful signals to the international investor community when they decide to stay. And the government really must offer attractive packages to those players as well. So, and of course, what is quite important because under conditions of crisis, it is not really possible to save everybody. It is not possible to save all banks from bankruptcy. It is not uh, possible to to save all market players from exit. So uh, one must be quite selective. And this is, uh, again, the job of the government as the coordinating institution to, uh, when it comes to the, and, and of course, the international donors, the international creditors, um, to, um, to select, to, 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 to create a smaller and more efficient banking system and come up with proper regulations for the banks that are actually going to shut down. Similarly, for major businesses, airlines, uh, for example, MEA or other major companies that are very important uh, for, uh, for, for Lebanese growth, I mean, to come up uh, with appropriate deals uh, of rescue or uh, those ones that are not as central and strategic for the Lebanese economy to come up with international consortia uh, of, um, uh, of essentially uh, supporting them or support the transfer of the, the transfer of their assets to interested investors as part of a broader deal. And I think that, so, uh, so what I have suggested is one, international financial measures through the IMF and the two central banks, two, uh, government policy for business support uh, through the World Bank and domestic funds. And also what I would, I mean, and also third, what is something that 
um, is becoming more and more widespread rationing measures for food supply um, um, so that all parts of Lebanon have continuous and, and, uh, lo and, uh, and logical access to food resources so that no, and, and not another public health or poverty crisis erupts, particularly in areas of the country that are more in need. So this would be my first round comments. And I'm happy to, um, uh, to, uh, hear, to hear your questions and answer them. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so please uh, just take a kind of reminder uh, to type your question into the question box in your control panel. And now I will introduce you uh, Mr. Frank Faber, Certified Public Accountant, a Chartered Accountant, CEO FWS Audits, Secretary General Impacta Germany. So uh, please, Frank. Yeah. Um, uh, Riyad, my friend, asked me um, how to succeed in a turbulent economy. And then I prepared uh, in the last two days a paper, uh, what to do, and I ended up in a, in a kind of policy advice. And Riyad uh, answered, hey, you are not answering my question. Uh, this is true. Yeah. So I had these uh, moments also uh, in my lifetime. Um, I, uh, our firm was uh, founded in a, in a turbulent economy in Russia in the 90s. We, we started our business in a crisis. So from this uh, point of view, I can understand this. You are sitting in this uh, critical situation and others give you long-term advice. This does not help you. Yeah? It is more or less a provocation. This I can understand. Um, also, what kind of expert am I? I'm, I'm a chartered accountant. I travel around the world. I have seen uh, many economies uh, going through crisis. To give you an example, together with my, my colleague from Ghana, we, we traveled in, in the north of, of Nigeria. And we visited the, the, the city of, of Kano, a million city. This is Boko Haram um, territory. The, the city was half empty. Chinese restaurants were empty. No business at all. And my friend told me, look, even the Lebanese businessmen left the city. When Lebanese businessmen leave the city, there is no business at all. These are hardcore businessmen. You should understand this. If they leave, you have nothing to do here. So, and this is true. In the past, uh, Lebanese businessmen have shown an extraordinary ability to adapt to the situations. I think we can say this from the last 20 years. This is extraordinary. And you see, you see all over the world, all over in Africa, Lebanese businessmen succeed. So with this said, I, I must admit, I have nothing to teach you. You know it better. Uh, what Walid said in the, in the first five minutes, um, uh, you are moving now in the direction of a cash economy. This I know from experience. This was also our starting point, And maybe this is good to remember. On this way to a cash economy, cash becomes more and more important. This is something that you cannot imagine now. You will experience this when it is, uh, when it is you, but there were times when $20 were wealth. I mean, you could do something with $20. Yeah, you could run an office with five employees for a month. This was the situation. This was the situation. And in this situation, something new can happen. So this is probably uh, the, 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 um, the practical thing that, 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 I can, that I can say. Policy advice, if we talk about policy advice, I mean, probably the only way out, out of this uh, situation is, is collective 
action. There are not so many um, possibilities for an individual entrepreneur to find a way out. Yeah, it is the whole situation, it is the economy. Yeah. To show you this, how serious it is, I think uh, Valet will also explain this. Um, I show you simply this picture here from the, uh, from the um, economist. This is a rating, it's a rating, you always have ratings. And here is Lebanon on the 65th place just before uh, Venezuela. Selected emerging uh, economies ranked on uh, their public debt, foreign debt, cost borrowing, reserve cover. You see, you see uh, at the moment to make this to make this understandable, understandable for our listeners from Western Europe, the situation in Lebanon is as serious as in Venezuela, but without oil. Thank you, Frank. Uh, we're moving to, the, to our uh, next uh, second poll, please. It will be shown now on uh, your screen, so please uh, take time to answer the second poll. Uh, so uh, this is the, the result. Astonishing, very good, very, it's, uh, I did not await this. This is uh, a sign of confidence. Yeah, more than 50% they have some. On the other hand, a pessimist is a well-informed optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your answers. And now we'll introduce to Mr. Mr. Walid Abu Sulaiman. Uh, Mr. Walid Abu Sulaiman is a financial expert, founder at Sidris Foundation, CEO Access Capital, Lebanon. Uh, we will hand over to you, Mr. Walid. Well, uh, first of all, just to add, I'm, uh, I'm a co-founder of Squared Financial, a financial institution in, in Europe. Yeah, okay. So I wanted to add this, this little detail. Right. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, Mosta Sharoun for this great initiative mm -hmm. and uh, for giving us and allowing us to present our views uh, with regards to the financial crisis, with regards to the situation in Lebanon, and at least to share our uh, expertise and experience uh, with regards to surviving uh, turmoils and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, turbulence in such, uh, uh, in such a pandemic. Uh, well, uh, first of all, it's uh, very important to understand the problem of uh, the uh, financial institution in Lebanon and why we are in this, uh, in this crisis today. Actually, Lebanon today is witnessing a three-dimensional crisis, which is a financial, economical crisis, and a monetary crisis. This is all due uh, to mismanagement in the public sector where the deficit was turning into a debt and today uh, the, the debt to GDP is around 180%, which is among the highest worldwide. And uh, there is an interlink, uh, interlinkage between the uh, public sector, the central bank and the banking sector. Unfortunately, these thro uh, three entities were financing uh, a public sector that is unproductive through remittances, through money that were coming from outside the country. And today we are here. We are here, we are facing, first of all, uh, uh, six, five to six exchange rates, the official rate uh, that is set by the central bank, uh, the, uh, the, the black market, uh, the rate at which uh, depositors below $3,000 can uh, withdraw their funds, uh, rate uh, at which depositors above $3,000 can withdraw their funds, uh, the uh, electronic transfers through Western Union and others. So this is very unique. And this is backfiring, first of all, on consumers. It's backfiring on depositors. And it's slowing down the economy. And 
certainly turning the economy into a cash economy because people do not unfortunately trust the system uh, anymore. So first of all, we should restore the confidence. We should try to fix. How do we fix this? The problem is the bleeding is in the, uh, in the public sector. Today we have, we're spending 40% on wages, wages in the public sector, which is enormous. Second, we have been spending around 40%, 40 billion dollars on the EDL, which is the uh, electricity. Uh, almost 40% uh, of the debt on the electricity, a sector that is non-productive at all. And we have been paying almost $90 billion on debt. And the service of the debt, the interest is $90 billion. So the fixing should start from here. Now, I agree with the, with the professor and with Frank that we have to uh, uh, actually try to uh, extend some funds or negotiate funds from the Federal Reserve and from the ECB along with the IMF. But the problem here is political as well. And the, the problem is more than this. The problem is that we are in a dollarized economy. We have around $120 billion in deposits in dollars that are not here anymore, unfortunately. That vanished. The Central Bank of Lebanon can print Lebanese pound, but they cannot print dollars. For instance, today we are witnessing a, a conversion of these deposits from dollars to Lebanese pounds because, as I said, the central bank cannot print uh, dollars anymore. So even the withdrawals, are there are no more withdrawals in dollars, even if you have a deposit in dollars. Hence, the scarcity of the uh, uh, FX, the the foreign exchange and the reserves and dollars. The other problem that we have as a structural problem, uh, we have uh, over the, the past three decades, Lebanon has instated a, a rentier economy versus a productive economy. Uh, we are uh, today uh, importing 90% of what we consume, whether mm. food products or other, uh, other products. So we need these dollars to eventually uh, import those goods. The problem is that we don't have any more dollars and shif shifting from a rentier economy to a productive economy, uh, we can't just do it by pressing a button. It needs some time. And uh, uh, myself, I don't like to say that we want to shift from a rentier economy to a, a productive economy. I would like to say that we want to grow the economy, including services and uh, production, whether agriculture, uh, uh, industrial, or even uh, knowledge economy, so producing uh, technology. Uh, this is this is our problem today, and certainly we need to uh, we need some funds, uh, whether an exceptional fund from the IMF or, or from the other uh, other banks, central banks. Now, uh, I will address this to to my. Uh, to my colleagues and to my co-citizens regarding the, the SMEs and how to, survive, how to survive in this turmoil, add to it the pandemic, as, as I said at the very beginning. The thing is, sometimes doing nothing is making money. Yet, yes, sometimes doing nothing is making money. Why? Because if you're operating on a loss, it's better to shut down for, for some time rather than operating on a loss. Now, I'm not here to uh, push people to shut down. No, not at all. Uh, any, any business or any entrepreneur is dealing with several stakeholders. You, you may be dealing with, uh, with a landlord if you are a tenant. You may be dealing with, with customers, with banks if you have a loan, or with, with suppliers. Uh, the, the, the first thing to do is to, uh, to cut the uh, expenses, so to decrease the expenses, first of all. And if you have a loan, you will have to uh, renegotiate your loan with the banks, whether uh, defer the payments or go for a balloon payment. And here I would like to say that the central bank has uh, uh, released many circulars, two or three circulars in this regard we can help you pro bono, of course, uh, 
dealing with the banks if, if need be. Also, uh, uh, on the supplier side, I would say you will have also to renegotiate your payment with the supplier, uh, fix the rate. It's very important to fix the rate because as I said at the very beginning, there are five or six exchange rates. And with, with the landlord, if you are a tenant, certainly you act very much like what uh, you would be uh, negotiating with the banks. So you ask for uh, payment uh, to defer the payments. So these are the, uh, these are the, the ABC of dealing when you are uh, in, a, in, a, in a problem. Yeah, go ahead, Frank. Yeah. Um... Uh, but it, I, I uh, totally agree with you. Yes, it's, 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 it's visible. The, the easiest structural problem in the background of the rentier economy, and there must be a change to a more sustainable path. Yeah, this is clear. The question is only if we uh, now talk about uh, support from the IMF. Do we not support the uh, rentier economy? Do we not um, stabilize the uh, ill system? This is, uh, it goes down to very practical um, uh, problems. You give now resources, but who will distribute the resources? In which manner? Sure. A few hours ago, there was a nice post from Human Rights Watch and they said, huh, IMF, if you go ahead and if you mobilize funds, be aware that these funds will be uh, distributed, how? In the old way, in a partisan way, through the sectarian approach. This is once again yeah. stabilizing the problem. Yeah, it's not a solution sure, of the problem. Sure, Part of no, the problem. no, no, no. What, 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 what I was saying, certainly you need reforms, but, but I started with this, uh, with this structural problem, uh, with the, with the tri-dimensional crisis. The problem today is we are putting at stake the, uh, the food, the medication, and the fuel. So if we want to prioritize, we need these funds at least to eat, to, to have a safety net, the social safety net. No, yeah, I'm telling so you. What, what is the IMF uh, Frank, suggestion? Frank, yes. just, just uh, allow, me, allow, me to say, allow me to say that we import rice, we import sugar. So even the, the commodities, we, we import everything, unfortunately. We are, not yeah. we are not ready for the, we are not ready for just to press a button and to, to shift from a rentier economy to a productive economy. Now, also with the IMF, it's going to be a long process. Today, the IMF is, is a listener. So is, they are just listening to, to different parties. And unfortunately, we don't have, we're not aligned. The different stakeholders, so the banks, the central bank, and the government are not aligned with regards to the figures and the losses. So it's a long process. Now down the road, people have to survive. People have to maintain their businesses. And to maintain their businesses and to survive, they need at least a safety net and they need to uh, uh, reach the, 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 the final line and to eventually uh, try to adapt with this survival mode. So the, these were the ideas to adapt with the survival mode. Now, on a, now to, to, to end up my, uh, my, just my intervention, uh, I would say on a positive note, it's, it's never too late, even mm -hmm. uh, with, with the depreciation of the currency, because the currency is not devaluating now, it's, it's the, the currency is depreciating. With the depreciation of the economy, we can be competitive if we produce locally and we, uh, we, we, we export. So this, is, this could be a positive, this could be rethinking our business model for, me, for small to medium enterprise. When I say, uh, we, we can export, we can export uh, agricultural products, industrial product, food, and also we can export the most important knowledge, services. We, I know for a matter of fact that lots of Lebanese people uh, have been involved in many startups abroad, so why not uh, uh, import the services from Lebanon to, uh, to the whole world? That's it. Thank you.
Yes, uh, maybe Professor Tiocharis wants to say something, right? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I agree with the colleagues. Uh, what, I mean, first, uh, and I would like to answer to one of the questions that I see here and then also follow up on what the colleagues have just said. So whether uh, Lebanon and Lebanese are victims of a major Ponzi scheme, uh, a pyramid scheme, a question that has been all over uh, me the media here. I mean, I think that what is quite important there here is... Professor, yes. there will be a session for the question and the answer. Oh, okay. The so, yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, what is really important to come up to Mr. Fabel's point, also Mr. Abu Suleiman's point, it is really important to maintain uh, trust in government because essentially one cannot do everything at the same time. We know from other experiences, I mean, Lebanon is now experiencing a financial crisis. Um, uh, the last thing that one should do is to question essentially the legitimacy of the government in a time of crisis. Uh, we, I mean, this is the government one must work with this particular government and impose conditionalities, of course, uh, so that you don't really have a vicious circle uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of crisis um, and underdevelopment. And of course, at the same time, what is really important for me is really the credibility of the central bank. I think that in, 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 in several financial crises historically, the central bank is usually the first institution that has done several things wrong. So, and the central bank, as we saw recently from the Eurozone crisis, with Mario Draghi was the main institutions that did several things correctly. So to keep the Eurozone as it was. I mean, and we know that historically also from the, from the US financial crisis, the great recession from the 20s, that the Fed really played a very negative role for the New York crash. I think what is really important is to focus on the central bank, to focus and improve the policies and maybe change the person if it is not working. So with this particular central banker uh, and maintain um, the functionality of this institution. I think it, this is of particular importance in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walid. Uh, just Thank you. Of, uh, regarding the question, uh, please uh, to mention uh, the names of uh, the panelists you, you're addressing to and uh, we will have them all at the end of the of the okay. yeah so uh, we will have um, a session to uh, to answer all the questions we have uh, now we're moving uh, to our third and last uh, poll so we'll take time also to answer um, the last question please we'll end the polling and we share the results this is a typical Lebanese result. Uh, we can say that more than 80% of the, of the participants are willing to uh, invest abroad. Uh, I'm saying that I'm coming up the sure I am, which is 40% the highest number. Uh, most probably 28%, 21%, and if I have chances, it's 33%. Thank you for your time. And uh, now we're moving to uh, our uh, uh, last uh, panelist, Mr. Riyad Zoui, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Maya. Um, well, for um, uh, telling about my opinion and express my opinion, um, I want to thank all the, uh, the participants that joined us. Uh, uh, because um, we have, we have, um, uh, participants from all over the world, from the States, from Africa, from Australia, and from our plans, we have many participants from UAE. So um, my, um, my uh, presentation will be focused more on how to practically face this, uh, this uh, uh, crisis. Um, so uh, I wish I want to share with you some kind of
Okay. Um, my session will be titled Tackling Challenging and Protecting Your Business. So how to protect our business uh, within the, this crisis. Um, along with the severe health and humanitarian crisis caused by the coronavirus pandemic, uh, executives around the world face enormous business challenges. The collapse of customer demand, significant regulatory modification, supply chain interruption, unemployment, economic recession, and degrees uncertainty. And like the health and humanitarian side of the crisis, the business side need ways to recover. So ad hoc responses won't work. Organization must lay the ground work to their recoveries now. A management theorist uh, proposed the strategy of five P's to face such crisis. Plan, ploy, pattern, position, and perspective. Well, we, uh, we want to ease this approach, so we name it differently. We, uh, we choose the five is by saying it's position, plan, perspective, projects, and preparedness. So uh, the following questions can guide you as you work to bounce back from the crisis. So about the 5P, we'll start with the first P, which is the position. What position can you attain during and after the pandemic? Because this is very important on a strategic uh, point of view. To make smart strategic decisions, you must understand your organization position in your environment. Who are you in your market? What role do you play? And who are you? Who are your main competitors? You must also understand where you are headed. Can you shut down, as uh, Walid said, said, your operation and reopen unchanged after the pandemic? Can you regain lost ground? Will you bankrupt or you can emerge as a market leader fueled by development during the lockdown? So this question, answering this question will give you a light about how you have to proceed in facing this crisis. We hear of many firms that are questioning their viability post pandemic, including those in the travel, hospitality and event industry. We also hear of firms accelerating their growth because their value propositions are in high demand, like office equipment, internet-enabled communication, uh, home delivery services. Because of such factors, feel, uh, firms will defer in their resilience. You should take steps now to map your probable position when your pandemic eases. So this is the first P. What about the second P, which is plan? <clears throat> so the question will be, what is your plan for bouncing back? The plan is a course of action pointing the way to the position you hope to attain. It should explicate what you need to do today to achieve your objectives tomorrow. In the current context, the question is what you, you must do to get through this crisis and go back to business when it ends. This is the major question. The lack of a plan only identify disorientation in an already confusing situation. So in normal circumstances, when you have no plan, you will be disoriented. How come with a, such a confusing situation? When drawing up the steps you intend to take, think broadly and deeply and take a long view. Because all over the world, we are hearing about a year, a two, a three years, to get over this pandemic. So our plan should not be projected for a year or two, should be uh, more than two years. The other, the third question will be, how will your culture and identity change? Because this pandemic and also the crisis that we are facing uh, will change our little bit in our identity and we have seen that all over the places. Perspective means the way an organization sees the world and itself. It's a likelihood your culture and identity will change as a result of a pandemic. A crisis can bring people together and facilitate a collective spirit of endurance, but it can also push people apart with individuals distrusting one another 
are predominantly looking after themselves. It's crucial to consider how your perspective may, might evolve. How prepared was your organization culturally to deal with the crisis? Will the, uh, uh, will the ongoing situation bring your employees together or drive them apart? Will they see the organization differently when this is over? Your answer will inform what you can achieve when the pandemic ends. The fourth question, fourth question is, what new project do you need to launch, run, or coordinate? Because you will face, in some cases, you see yourself that the way that you run your business before in terms of servicing or even items, it need to be uh, adjusted. Your answers to the question above should point you to set a, uh, of projects of tackling your coronavirus and economical related problem. The challenge is to prioritize and coordinate initiatives that will future prove the organization. Beware of starting numerous projects that all depend on the same critical resources, which might be a specific individual, such as top manager, of specific departments, such as IT. With too many new initiatives, you can end up with a war over resources that delays or derails your strategic response. Our five important questions to ask, which is the final question, how prepared are you to execute your plans and projects? Finally, you need to assess your organization preparedness. Are you ready and able to accomplish the project you've outlined? Particularly, if much of your organization has shifted to remote work, we see big differences in preparedness at the individual, team, organization, and national levels. The resources at hand, along with the speed and quality of decision-making processes, vary greatly, and the difference will determine who achieves and who falls short of success. So this is the first part of the question that uh, that uh, we have to ask, and we already asked. These are the five questions that we 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 we, we ask, and the the second part of my presentation is what are the ways to protect the entrepreneurs. <clears throat> In such an incredible crisis, there are three ways entrepreneurs can protect themselves. The first way is to secure liquidity. One of the key challenges for small businesses is access to cash. Running any business is a risky endeavor. However, small businesses are particularly vulnerable. According to study, only about half of small businesses last longer than five years. Overhead costs like rent, payroll, and utility leave very li little liquid cash to owners, especially in the early years. Add to that the lack of revenue from slowing services and newly required benefits stemming from the pandemic, and our entrepreneurs will be devastated. In order to combat this short-term challenge, small business owners should advocate for effort to provide immediately liquidity and keep business solvent. The second way is to ensure access to capital. For, for, for franchise businesses, for example, liquidity is just part of the equation. The cost of goods sold in the service industry is primarily wage paid to staff. Debit flows from small businesses associations loans are common for small businesses and can create additional pressure on business owners. With demand down and paid leave provisions, now a reality lays off are a real concern. The third way is to engage with policy makers. This can be done individually and it can be done in partnership with other entrepreneurs. The mediums for, for engagement are endless. Social media, letters, email, phone calls are all effective ways to engage. The method is less important than the message. And the message is this, small business, are the lifeblood of our communities and economy. We need relief in the midst of the crisis. 
the small businesses with our communities provide jobs and economic growth to local economies. This is where most people are feeling the impact of the pandemic. Our coffee shop, restaurants, gyms, and stores are all closed. Our friends and family members are losing jobs. It's time to take action as the adage goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We say it in Arabic, uh, this is in Arabic. In this pandemic environment, this wisdom is just as much for small business owners as it's for their patrons. So uh, I, I, I end up my, my, my presentation. I want to say that this, uh, this guidance or recommendation that I already uh, provided are, you, I know that you think this is very theoretical. Yes, it is theoretical but it is it will give a good remedy for suffering businesses so but all businesses have their own uh, um, their own privacy their own way of work their own uh, processes so it will be uh, it should be implemented in a way that guarantee uh, uh, success uh, thank you thank you mr Riyad. uh now uh, we'll go to the session of questions and uh, we will try uh, to answer all the questions we have. Uh, we have some questions with no mention name of the panelists, so um, uh, you will choose who will answer this uh, yeah. question. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and we'll start with the first uh, person who asked question is Mr. Eli Mirad. But uh, Elimrad, uh, he didn't uh, address anyone uh, of, the, of you. So uh, who will uh, answer, Mr. Eli? Uh, what is the question? The question is, COVID is, uh, is it the economic problem in Lebanon? Do you agree with me? Well, it, yours, uh, your, you can say that, you can reply to this question. You are I'm sorry, I did, not, I did not hear the question. Mr. What is the question? Uh, you can see it in the chat mode. If you open the chat yes. mode, you'll see all the questions. Yeah, in the question and answers. Uh, Mr. Elimrad. Ah, it's a question and answer, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Elimrad, Mr. Elimrad asked, COVID is it the economic problem in Lebanon? Do you agree with me? Well, uh, COVID was an additional problem to the existing problems, uh, and it accelerated, unfortunately, the, the meltdown. Uh, now, it's, uh, we are not in a hopeless case. We can fix things, as we said, but it will take some time and there are painful measures to be taken uh, by the government, by the banks, by the central banks, by the, uh, by the SMEs and even by the households. Because unfortunately, Lebanese people, and Lebanese, uh, the Lebanese government, we, we were all living above our means above our means. So now we have to eventually go back to reality and uh, try to fix things because we, are, we would be facing at least a wave of three to five years where we have to, uh, to accommodate and to, to live with, to cope with the very difficult uh, economic and financial situation. At least you can say that COVID is the political uh, problems because COVID gives all governments around the world the possibility to put all political discussions into a fridge. No, 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 I don't <laughs> agree. I don't agree, Frank. I don't agree okay. because, uh, because in the midst of this, uh, this pandemic, uh, we, can, we have witnessed we Lebanese political tensions last week, the week before, so uh, it, it never stops. It never stops in Lebanon, it never stops. It's a, it's a continuous, uh, it's a continuous uh, process of actions, the political conflicts and uh, uh, different views, etc. Because unfortunately in Lebanon, there is no uh, nation's interest. There are personal interests, personal but agendas. I was, I was surprised by the um, way how your protest movement appeared. This was no partisan, it was the unity of the people. And for many observers from the West, 
this was a, a surprise and it was a, maybe for you it's it's difficult to understand but it was a positive sign for many of us yeah 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 this is this is i i agree with you on this but i was saying with regards to the pandemic did, did this did not put on hold or stop the uh, the political frictions and tensions and this is also, yeah yeah this is also what riyadh said i mean there is always a chance that a crisis can people together yeah let's hope so Hopefully, thank hopefully. you. Thank you, panelist. So we're moving to the second question is by Mr. Riyad Jwaidi. Uh, he asked, does any measures on the level of, securi of securing liquidity or any international financial support, even to local SMEs or enterprise, make sense without focusing on the real issue? Where Lebanon and Lebanon are victims of a major transit chain, and the real reasons that the led or the country to the situation are still in action. You can read the question in the Q&A uh, field, uh, category. I can take this over if it's okay. Yes, please, Professor. Yes, so, I mean, this relates again to the question of the credibility of the central bank. Um, I mean, there is uh, overall in the international press, um, uh, the, I mean, the, there are discussions about this existence of this of a Ponzi scheme. I mean, I I would be a bit uh, careful with uh, characterizations. Of course, it's I mean we can discuss things openly. Um, so a Ponzi scheme, for those of you that are not aware with this terminology, I mean we had a major Ponzi scheme, for example, 25 years ago in Albania, uh, which led or it's also a pyramid scheme, which essentially involves bad faith by government officials in managing public money for and then in, 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 uh, in coordination with private investors so that both the public and private sector actually collect profits through these illegal corrupt deals. Um, so I think that unless, I mean, and of course one can say that these things can never be proven, you can only infer them. I mean, in the Albanian case, it was pretty obvious because the Ponzi scheme happened on the basis of one company. I don't think that in Lebanon we could have essentially substantial evidence uh, about this. In any case, what I would say, I think the key institution in order to restore this trust is the central bank and the, and the measures and the policies that the central bank is taking. So, uh, because no, no policy scheme is possible in any economy without the participation or the silence of the central bank. So. Um, I believe that um, a major um, uh, uh, shifting of the central bank policy in a more productive and faster direction, negotiations with IMF mm -hmm. and uh, Fed and ECB at the same time is the right thing to do. Thank you. Uh, another question from Mr. Hossam Al Kurdi. A uh, question to Mr. Walid. How Lebanese companies, manufacturers can import goods to support the economy and life requirements as there is no access to ESD? And what will be the impact if they don't have the access later? Yeah, uh, yesterday or the day before, the uh, Prime Minister and the, uh, the Governor of the Central Bank agreed uh, through a mechanism to support or to extend the US dollars to both uh, merchants uh, to import uh, necessities, goods, uh, food products, and to eventually, they are also looking into extending dollars to manufacturers, to industrials, uh, in, with regards to importing uh, raw materials. So this, is, uh, this has been agreed. Now uh, we, we're waiting for the implementation and it, this would go through banks, through local banks. They would be extending those hard currencies to both merchants and industrials. Thank you. A question from Mr. Eli Shamoun. Uh, he didn't mention uh, the policy that he addressing to. So uh, do you think that when the currency will be stable, the dollar strength with the Lebanese lira will draw investors in because labor and resources will be cheap for them? Yeah, this is what uh, Walid also mentioned. Uh, Walid, you, you talk about this issue, right? Yes, with regards to the, the currency depreciation. So this would uh, this would bring in some 
competitiveness on the on the table and yet the the we we would be able to compete with other countries producing similar products in terms of uh, exports yeah well i want to ask you something regarding this issue as an expert uh, of course if you can uh, give it in a summary way uh, yes. we, we hear a lot about uh, there is an advantage of the depreciation of the Lebanese lira. And to the yeah. to level that, that uh, we feel that this is maybe it's a good option. Can you uh, tell us what would be the major uh, bad, uh, bad, impact, bad. Uh, aside of the good impact? What would be the bad impact, not on a macro level, uh, for, the small, for the entrepreneurs? Certainly for entrepreneurs, the purchasing power will decrease. Uh, the, uh, the cost of, uh, of buying uh, goods uh, imported uh, will, 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 will increase. So it might turn into uh, an inflation or a hyperinflation if there are uh, earnings in, in Lebanese pounds and uh, exporting uh, goods in, uh, or importing goods in, in hard currency. So this would be a major problem, and this would do, we would see a, a decrease in the in the revenue. Well. Yeah, professor. Yes, exactly. I mean, depreciation alone is not really a solution to anything unless you really mm -hmm. have a stable economic environment. Dep depreciation is only a sec. In terms of supply, in terms of pro productive capacity of companies, and the stability of currency in a way that is a reliable deposit instrument. So, yeah, I mean, uh, depreciation can help, but it's not a panacea. It's not a self, uh, it's not a recipe that solves everything. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mrs. Jack. Actually, actually, Professor, it was not a recipe given by me. It was a fact now that we I know, are I know, I know, I know. Because just I, just to make major... this, this thing, because today, uh, depreciation without the fixing, uh, uh, the, the currency might shoot, uh, the dollar might shoot, might skyrocket, you know. You need to fix the, the balance of payments. You need to, to fix the trade balance and some economic measures before actually trying to float the currency and i would i wouldn't go for a for a free floating i would go for a crawling peg to start yeah, yeah. with along, along with along with some uh, some funds uh, in hard currency to eventually defend this crawling peg mm -hmm. i agree with you yes this is the uh, sorry maya sorry uh, okay okay you were you were hearing the beep this is one of our common problems now the electricity went off, and we were waiting the generator to. <laughs> we, we, we've tackled this. We've tackled this. Yeah. Okay, Maya, please. Okay, uh, so uh, a question from Ms. Jackie Marouf. Uh, she's asking Mr. Bussayman, what should we yes. expect on May 27th from the announced central bank new measures? Thank you. Uh, yeah, certainly. I I just tackled this. Uh, the measures would be, uh, they would be extending, uh, first of all, dollars to merchants and uh, on a second, uh, second stage to uh, industrials in order to import necessities, uh, food products and uh, to industrials, they would be as well um, uh, importing the raw material. Now, this, this might also be coupled with some uh, drastic measures, measures with regards to uh, exchanges. For instance, they are looking at only uh, granting citizens uh, not more than $200 uh, in terms of exchange. So you can only buy $200. This would ease a little bit the pressure on, uh, on uh, the lira and on the dollars. But this would also, this would also create another black market because people would go seek more dollars because eventually they need those dollars. And this might also go into some uh, fake IDs. People would eventually uh, try to fake IDs to get uh, access to more dollars. So this, this is also a double-edged sword. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Riyad Jwaidi also is asking Mr. Riyad Zoui, 
A recent study of Dubai Chamber date May 18, uh, 2020, expects 70% of companies are expecting business closure within six months because of COVID-19 pandemic. How do you explore this to Lebanon, especially given uh, the ex existing political economic crisis prior to COVID? Yes, uh, this is true. Uh, I checked this uh, study and I read about it uh, yesterday. Well, uh, I talked about um, resilience uh, parameters from uh, culture to a culture. Um, this, uh, I think this is a very pessimistic approach, uh, and I don't think this is a, a, an approach given from the government. Maybe it is a study from outside UAE. Uh, of course, uh, the economy of the UAE would be, uh, would be uh, affected uh, because it's, uh, it's very dependent on, uh, on, 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 uh, on activity that are uh, hurt by the pandemic. Uh, as, as a comparative way to Lebanon, uh, if I, if I, if I uh, say what uh, Frank just uh, spoke about the Lebanese, I think uh, the only positive side that, uh, uh, that uh, we, uh, we, uh, we earned uh, from all the last crisis went uh, and is how much we were we will be able to overcome it because uh, um, what, when I see a study like that in UAE, I think this will not happen in Lebanon. And you you saw this and you realized this in in our polls that we already did. There is all there will be always a positive um, uh, um, approach to the crisis that we are in. Uh, other country, if they face what we are facing right now, they will collapse in in a in a in two or three days, and you will see all the people on the streets. Now we still not seeing people on the streets. This is not good, but this is a sign of that people are still um, thinking that things will be better. And I don't think that Lebanon uh, he will Lebanon will suffer for sure but will not be uh, uh, dramatically uh, um, hurt. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jouaidi also, he was continuing his uh, question by adding, isn't Lebanon effectively experiencing a, pol a political governance crisis and the economic, financial, uh, monetary crisis are only the tip of the uh, iceberg? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're right. And this is what we was discussing before starting the, the webinar with the gentleman. We said that uh, we have all the potential to give solutions to our economic problems and crises. The issue uh, is, is in the political debates that we are facing every day on every single uh, details. So uh, it is right. It is right. Riyadh is, uh, is, a, is an entrepreneur in UAE. Uh, one of our customers in UAE. Uh, he's, he was very uh, investing very much in Lebanon, and unfortunately, and and, and maybe fortunately, he has uh, an option in UAE, so he can he can uh, he moved out to UAE, uh, and he's uh, upset about what's happening in Lebanon and how. His business has affect, was affected. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Riyad. Uh, another question from Mr. Andre Audi to uh, Mr. Fabel and Professor Gr uh, Grigoriadis: Is more depreciation uh, inev in inevitable in this situation? Uh, actually, this is a doctor, Andre Audi, not uh, this is a doctor. Uh, so, all right, yeah. sorry, doctor. Uh, who will answer this? Uh, uh, Frank and so I could I could basically say that uh, we may we, I mean since there is I mean this gap this existing gap between the black market uh, exchange rate and the official exchange rate one would expect that the central bank would actually move more in the direction would try to close this gap uh, between the black market and the official economy so I mean in one word yes some depreciation would be inevitable but hopefully not much. Yes. Uh, can you, you, have, yeah, you want to add something, Frank? No, I mean, uh, you can say um, 
uh, only a few things are inevitable in life. <laughs> <So> <laughs> only one thing, <laughs> only one thing. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, go ahead. All right, uh, we have Mr. Elibu Farhad. He's asking how can, how can retailers be better prepared for any future crisis like this? Uh, we already uh, we already uh, tackled this uh, issue uh, by the three ways that we uh, we um, experienced and we explained. Uh, this is the most essential ways, uh, which one one of them was the cash flow. Uh, so uh, this is the best way, and we hope we will not face uh, such uh, crisis in the near future because we cannot handle more uh, <laughs> as the Lebanese. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. He added one more question or two more questions for Mr. Wade Bussleiman. Uh, he asked if is it possible to combine the ethics of banking procedure in the field of banking operations with the sources of financial crisis? Uh, I didn't. I didn't understand what what he, he really means. Yeah, uh, maybe, I will ask this question I if if he's. So, if he's if he's if he wants to ask that the, the, the banks are behaving somehow not really ethically uh, in this financial crisis, I would say the most important uh, uh, the most important thing uh, with regards to the banking sector is trust. So, when trust is is lost somehow, it's very hard to restore it, even if you are. Uh, if you are solvent and if you have enough liquidity, uh, but uh, the behaviors and the services and the preferential treatments that we have witnessed uh, within this crisis by by the banks have somehow backfired on the on the on the banking sy uh, system and uh, lost was uh, the the trust was lost unfortunately. Yes, yes. I hope I answered. I hope I answered this question. If yes. not, let him ask. Hmm. Professor, please. Yes, and I would like to follow up on this very good comment, saying that uh, we should see this crisis also as an opportunity to uh, to uh, improve the Lebanese banking system, to make it less scattered, more functional, smaller, and more efficient. All right. Thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll end this uh, session with the last question from Ali Farhat. He asked, how critical is social media outreach in such events? Uh, yes, uh, uh, go ahead, please, Walid. You want to ask? Me? How critical is, uh, is social media outreach? Uh, uh, well, social media, sometimes people are, uh, you know, the online business is, is becoming uh, a huge... Uh, uh, it's taking a huge, a huge chunk of the of the businesses, whether uh, uh, online uh, trading, uh, whether uh, whether uh, online services, etc. So to, certainly, social media is is a mean and a tool to create awareness, to uh, to promote and to uh, to conduct businesses, especially in uh, in these days where where. Uh, uh, the sharing sharing economy is vanishing, and it's more of uh, an isolating economy. So uh, isolation goes along with social media. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm, good answer. Yeah, I want to say also something regarding this. Um, well, I think that uh, the, the, the entrepreneurs and the company there that were good prepared in terms of being uh, ready for the online business or the social media platform will have more uh, options or more capacities to face such a crisis. So when you are... Can I share, can I share an experience, a personal experience with regards to the online business? Yeah, sure. Just uh, uh, myself, I'm in the um, I'm in the online business. So what we offer, we cater online uh, trading, financial trading on financial instruments. So for us, there are no boundaries, and we were not affected. People from Africa, from uh, from China, from Latin America, from Europe, from from the Middle East, were actively trading and accessing the market, uh, currencies, commodities, etc. 
So our uh, online business was not affected at all by the pandemic. On the contrary, uh, we, we, we've witnessed growth because of uh, people sitting uh, at home just doing nothing out of curiosity or out of investment. They, they wanted to uh, venture into this. So no, uh, online business and uh, social media platforms are are a very uh, powerful tool to conduct business and, and I, as I said, to, to shift and, and uh, uh, to try to get acquainted with uh, uh, whether uh, uh, sharing economy or uh, isolating economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Joy, I had another question to Mr. Busleyman. Uh, does the central bank has enough means to intervene to stabilize the LDP at any level and aren't punctual measures only a way to gain time? Is there any limit to where the LDP can go? Well, uh, the, central, the central bank, uh, thank you for the question. The central bank decided uh, since uh, October 17 to let go and uh, to not to intervene in the um, and the market uh, in terms of defending the, the lira uh, because of uh, because of the the, the shrinking uh, of their uh, of their fx reserves so no uh, if if the central bank were to defend the, the peg we wouldn't have witnessed uh, five or six exchange rates so basically uh, the central bank decided to spend or to preserve these FX reserve and to spend them, spend them only on the three necessities which are food, medication and fuel. Thank you. Yes, uh, Professor, please. Yes, which again explains why uh, uh, liquidity umbrella, international liquidity umbrella is really important. Oh, well, wait a moment. <laughs> I mean, um, it is not like this that uh, everybody in Western Europe is a fan of the International Monetary Fund. There are also other points of view. There is also the uh, opportunity of bilateral negotiations without the IMF. And this is, maybe it is a little bit unusual. In the past, we had this only in Malaysia. Malaysia was successful in doing so. But it is an option and it is worth to think about this. Yeah, it is, there is also the option to work without the IMF. But this can be only done if there is some kind of national unity. So if you have one uh, strong uh, backing of your uh, local political stakeholders, I would be interested to, to hear from my colleagues whether is there is a chance for this bilateral restructuring. Uh, well, we have had an experience a couple of years ago with the, uh, with the, the CEDAR. The CEDAR, it's, it's a group of, uh, you know, uh, investors, whether uh, donors, whether uh, uh, countries or any uh, other organizations. The problem is, uh, as you said, there, is, there isn't any uh, political uh, consensus today uh, eventually to move, to move forward. The political consensus must start with reforms, politically, political reforms, monetary reforms, financial reforms, administrative reforms, etc. The thing is that the clock is ticking. We don't have enough time. And with the pandemic, uh, I would say it's, it's, it's quite hard to get access to liquidity even on bilateral agreements. So uh, the, the IMF was a, was a kind of shortcut eventually to get access to, to this uh, exceptional fund, which is 10 times our quota. Our quota today is around 860 million. We can, we can be granted, we can be granted around nine, nine billion dollars right after meeting the conditionality of the IMF and the condi conditionality and conditions are quite tough and they start by floating the currency and end up by uh, uh, by many many social and many many taxations uh, uh, the conditions are already on the table the conditions are already on the table. I heard that VAT uh, no. should be broadened, that you, the yeah. VAT base should be broadened. 
Yeah, not only the VAT, the uh, corporate tax, income tax, etc. But these are these are taxes. We 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 are in a recession. Uh, if you increase taxes, I would say you 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 would be yeah. killing the economy uh, more and more. So yeah. basically, we're still uh, at the very beginning. It's it's very preliminary. And as I said, the IMF today is a listener. So they're not proactive. They're just digesting the info they're getting from the, the government. Yeah, yeah. Now, we still don't have a consensus over the figures because everyone is seeing the figures from its own angle. So uh, the, whether the central bank, the government, or, or the banking sector. The banking sector is saying that there are no losses. The central bank is saying that uh, the other assets in his balance sheet are considered as... Uh, uh, they're not considered as losses. They can carry forward uh, the, the losses and eventually um, uh, out of the seniorage cover the losses. But the seniorage in itself is a, a source of revenue of uh, any central bank, but a source of revenue in the, in the local currency. So you cannot print dollars. The central bank of Lebanon cannot print dollars. And these losses, the 40 billion, are losses in majority in dollars, they're not in, in liras. So this is this is problematic, and this is the big problem because the banks have invested the dollar deposits not not in treasury bills and liras, but mainly in dollars in uh, in the central bank with the central bank, either through a certificate of deposits or plain vanilla deposits. Yeah. This is the problem. Mm. I, I cannot imagine how you can increase VAT on, on food and daily, um, uh, daily needs um, to 11% in a country where you have hunger revolts. The only result will be that more banks will burn. Yeah. So more, more banks, as we have seen lately, bank, in bank, uh, the, the VAT is and with this, more banks will burn, and with this, the rioters will be doing the business of the IMF. Yeah, yeah. And the VAT will will not affect the food because only the imported food will be subjected to VAT. But this is not what the IMF says. They want to broaden the base. No, the, the, in, all, in all places, all, uh, I, I think at least in UAE and Lebanon, the food is not affected by VAT. I'm, I mean the food that is the, the raw material mm. food, not the imported food. But in all... Yeah, do you want cash or not? So you must broaden the tax basis. This is the position of the yeah. IMF. We'll, we'll, we'll yes, but... the comment of uh, Professor before uh, start to end our uh, session. Uh, go ahead, Professor, please. Yes, exactly. I mean, um, uh, he cannot really expect from Lebanon now to broaden the tax base. I mean, this is, again, uh, a measure that takes place only after the first wave of the crisis has been uh, overcome. What is really important to think in terms of bilateral, uh, or in terms of bilateral um, assistance or agreement is this um, central bank liquidity swaps that we observed also in the euro, uh, in, the, in, the, in the European area. We had, for example, the European Central Bank offering a similar agreement to Hungary during the financial crisis. We have the Swiss bank, the Swiss central bank offering um, agreements, similar agreements to Poland and Hungary in return for euros. So it, it, it may not be just the Fed because of the high level of dollarization of the Lebanese economy. It can be other banks that can uh, offer cre credit liquidity swaps in dollars. Um, and we had the, agree the agreement between Qatar and Turkey in the region in 2018. So I think that there are several solutions that involve both bilateral and multilateral paths. Mm. Okay, thank you. Mm. Okay. Thank you uh, to our uh, panelists. It looks like we covered almost of, uh, of the question. Uh, is there anything uh, you want to, to cover before we wrap up, panelists? Oh, I think you. there's also the possibility of live questions from the audience, huh? if they would like to raise their hands. Yeah, they, they actually use the, the, the session, the area, the field, and they ask questions in the question and answer area. They didn't raise the any hands. So that's why. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a very informative session, and it's already the end of, uh, of it. We appreciate you being here. There. Thanks again for joining us today, and we will see you next time. Have a nice day. Have a nice Thank day. You. Thank you. Ila <laughs> Dika.